I'd like to call to order the Health and Human Service Committee meeting of Wednesday, March 8th, 2023 at 3 p.m. If we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item tonight is uh, adoption of the agenda. Romano adopts the agenda. Support being sickle. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, please call the roll. The next item is approval of the minutes dated February 1st, 2023. Can I get a motion? So moved, Perno. Support Nard. Mo uh, motion and support. Any discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Motion passes 10 to 0. Moving on to item five, which is public participation. If anyone wishes to speak at this time, you will be ha you will have three minutes um, to do so. Um, please state your name before you speak. And there's also another one at the end of the meeting for anyone that would rather wait till the end. Anyone wish to be heard at this time? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and move on to presentations. And our first presentation this evening, and I'd like to thank uh, Community Mental Health Services for coming out today and giving us this presentation. I do really appreciate it. Is from Mr. Penkateo. Um, <laughs> Penkatai. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'll make the motion to receive and file all presentations. Support. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation. Um, before I get officially started here, uh, Chair Brown, I wanted to thank you for the email about the, uh, the program there that was serving 60 to 70 folks in our community. Um, it's called Preserve Ind Independence, I believe. Yeah, uh, my staff did go out and did an in-person visit on the, the 6th. Um, they have an interesting program. It's currently does not quite meet any of the criteria for our Medicaid covered services, but with a little tweaking, uh, we think we can get them there. So we are moving to establish a contract with them and help support that program going forward. So fingers crossed um, and moving things a little quickly since they are currently providing services to some uh, folks that are already in our system. Uh, we hope to have things set by the end of this month and to be able to, uh, so they'll be able to stay in that uh, current location. Very good, thank, thank you. you for that. Get to play with technology now. Um, we were asked to present on the kind of what's going on with mental health and substance use. Uh, so Helen Klingert is here. Um, Helen is our director of substance use service and definitely the subject matter expert on everything we're doing in that arena. So thank you for joining me, Helen. Sure. Um, basically, quick overview. Um, I supplied the, the packet ahead of time. Um, it is not my intent to read all of that, <laughs> as Andrew was worried about <clears throat> in the back. But in short, when the pandemic hit, before the pandemic hit, we had staff shortages with direct care workers, direct support professionals, the, the frontline staff primarily supporting people in the community in the adult foster care homes, the specialized facilities or group homes. When the pandemic hit, that got really bad. Um, our providers have just done an amazing job of um, keeping things going through the pandemic, um, especially early with all of the um, precautions and the frequent changes. What we've seen now over time is that staff shortage has expanded and it's now pretty much hitting all levels um, of, of our staff. So it went from direct support professionals to our case managers, to our clinical staff, um, up to our uh, psychiatrist and things like that. 
a board certified child psychiatrist right now is very hard for anybody to get. And <clears throat> when I, oh, the, uh, my first slide here also touches on the certified community behavioral health clinic. That's a CCBHC and we're really, um, we're known for our um, acronyms and abbreviations. But uh, Senator Stabenow um, championed this program in her Excellence with Mental Health Care Act. What it allows us to do now, we started it as an expansion grant, which was a federal grant directly with the, the federal government. In October of 21, we became part of Michigan, the state of Michigan's demonstration project. So it's pretty much how we operate now going forward. The important parts of that are it's for integrated health care. So we're looking at the whole person now, the physical health and the behavioral health and substance use. Um, the criteria now at our front door used to be we had to <clears throat> spend a lot of time determining the person's eligibility for service. You had to meet the mental health code criteria as having a serious mental illness or for children it was a serious emotional disturbance. On the substance use side there was some back and forth um, or you had to have an intellectual and developmental disability again as described in the mental health code. Under this program our front door is more open now, and we can see folks who are in the mild to moderate category, which again, that's our language, but it's people who have maybe some um, anxiety issues, some mild depression, and they're not hitting that serious level where they've actually been um, in a hospital for their mental health concerns and things like that. So our front door is more open. <clears throat> Residency in Macomb County is no longer a criteria either. There's a lot of people that go back and forth across the, the county lines. Again, there used to be people who would come in and their residence was not really clear. And that could have delayed some of their services and there was discussions behind the scenes. This has made it much easier for us to provide a, full, a fuller array of service to more people. This slide, again, so the effects of the pandemic, they hit us early. Um, the CDC did a study in June of 20, and they found that a little over 25% of all the children surveyed had actively considered suicide in the last 30 days. When I came across that study, I just, I, I stopped. I had to reread it, had to go back. I checked the, the source and everything else. When they're looking at those statistics now, when they're looking at young girls, it goes up to about 33%. So our children have really been impacted by the pandemic. And again, we're trying to um, reach out to the schools, definitely, and build those connections and you know try to meet these needs as best we can. Um, this, um, I'm proud to say too, we did complete our community needs assessment. I just sent out the, the final version to my board of directors and to the leadership team um, I'll be able to share that with uh, the Board of Commissioners uh, probably tomorrow. Um, and we'll be following up on that as well. But these are some of the statistics from our community needs assessment. And again, it shows the, the change in need um, since the pandemic hit. We're also, um, we track our calls, call center, customer service calls. Um, it's a very accurate data number for us to, to look at. Those numbers now are trending right here. So when you look, uh, 23 is the green. So, and that's um, year on year by month. So you can see in October of 20, uh, this is fiscal year, tw oh, fiscal year 23. So that would have been October of 22. Um, in January of 23, we really had we're, we're up over 6,000 uh, phone calls into our customer service line. Um, our department there is doing an excellent job. Our response times to answer um, are really good. We're answering most calls in under 20 seconds, um, about 96% of those now. And then number of unique people receiving our services, again, by month, you can see that really uh, clear increase in, in need, the number of people we're serving. So what are we doing about it? 
well, I'll touch on that in a little bit about the, the future steps. But Helen, you want to talk about our substance use? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, so for substance use services, uh, we cover any range of substance use services from a mild to moderate to severe level of need. Uh, we do prevention services as well as treatment and recovery. Um, so kind of covering the whole gamut. So we try to work on an approach from preventing an issue from happening through our prevention work and creating healthier communities through working with different community coalitions that are spread out throughout the county uh, to do a lot of services that way. Um, as part of the substance use services, um, it's part of the prepaid inpatient health plan under the Medicaid that we have. It uh, receives those dollars as well as some specific block grant dollars that we get from the state and federal government. And then a lot of uh, more unique specialty grant funds have come in related to COVID and the American Rescue Plan Act and this um, uh, uh, opioid rescue type services as well. So we've been able to add some services over the last couple of years to what we do. So as a department uh, responsible for the services within the county, we determine the needs. So we do a community needs assessment. We focus on trends. We watch to see what our overdose rates might be, for example. We look to see uh, what kind of issues are showing up in our treatment programs, what are the primary substances of abuse, things like that, and um, adjust our mix as needed to always meet those needs. We contract all of our services out, and that's with licensed and accredited programs for the service level that they're providing. That's part of what we're required by the state to do. Within that, the, the staff that work at those programs also hold a specialty credential or certification from an accreditation board that says they really specialize in substance use prevention or treatment work or peer recovery coach services, so that we really make sure we have people who understand the disorders uh, serving those with that need. Uh, we develop and manage, manage all the budgets that go along with that, and then we monitor all the services. We conduct audits, we pay the bills as they come in and the claims from the providers, and we do all the reporting functions to the state. Um, we also work to educate the community on the services, try to get the word out of, of how to access services within the county if you don't have private insurance, you know, and how we can help and assist and what's out there and available. We conduct recipient rights investigations as it relates to any problems that somebody might encounter if they're at a service level. Even if it's not somebody we contract with, if it's a licensed program within the county, we are the ones who oversee that to provide that pr protection for people in our community. Um, so those are just some of the, the major roles that we do. The types of services that we have, uh, we do prevention, as I mentioned, work with community coalitions, do educational fairs, a lot of work with school districts, uh, working with our youth and families to help educate and raise awareness on tobacco, alcohol, and other substances. Uh, we do early intervention work where we have special programming in particular that works with adolescents that are in middle school and high schools where we actually provide a therapist out into the schools and the schools partner and allow release time for those children uh, to address those high-risk needs that they might be experiencing, again, to help prevent future problems for those individuals or to help prevent anything from escalating. We do traditional clinic-based services that offer outpatient and intensive outpatient, meaning they come several times a week for that care and that service. We can offer medication-assisted treatment or for opiate use disorders, offering all the federally approved medications, methadone, suboxone, Vivitrol type products for that, and we contract for that. And within that, we have a specialty service called Opiate Health Home Services, where we also contract with some medical providers, federally, health, federally qualified health plans, where they also are prescribing those medications, but also doing care coordination so that we can really wrap our services around individuals to make sure that all their needs are being met to get them on a healthy recovery path. Uh, we provide for residential treatment, which is a structured 24-hour setting where people go and they're going to different educational classes, group therapy, learning um, healthy lifestyle, recreational activities while they're there, very intensive care for about a three-week period of time to really get the foundations of recovery in place. Uh, some of those individuals who need that service may also need withdrawal management or detoxification from alcohol or other specific drugs. And so that's provided as an initial stage to make sure that they're healthy and safe. Um, 
we have a variety of recovery support services. So we can provide certified peer recovery coaches to help assist people at any level of care, work with them in the community on recovery resources, getting connected with things like self-help and other things that they need to do to get themselves on track as part of their recovery plan. We have recovery home services. Well, we pay for the initial portion of somebody's stay in a substance-free home environment where other people uh, also agree they don't want to use substances, they want a supportive environment while they're getting back on their feet and getting employed and going, you know, getting back to work or school, whatever that might be for them. And we also help support two recovery centers in our community as well. So anybody from the community can come and engage in healthy activities, have fun, learn a skill, you know, maybe take a yoga class, offer a variety of different things. And this is a continuum that people might go through at different levels and, um, you know, you can start at any point based on the need and work uh, through the different systems there. Just to give you an idea of what we see as a public, publicly funded system um, of what our needs are and who's presenting to us, we kind of look at what is the major substance that you're taking when you come into our system. You might be using more than one particular substance, but in our county, um, opiates still lead the way for us as the primary problem. Doesn't mean they're not using alcohol or other things, but opiates is like the, the most severe issue that they're having. So as you can see from this chart, you know, um, almost, you know, a largest chunk of our population coming in are, are using that way, followed by alcohol. They're pretty close, neck to neck. You know, 15 years ago, alcohol was, you know, way off the charts. You know, we'd have about 80% of the people presenting with an alcohol use disorder. Alcohol still is the most abused substance that we treat. It's just not always the primary substance. So many people use multiple substances. And then just to give you an idea, some of the other things are out there, uh, just minor in comparison uh, to these. So we do put a lot of focus on opiates and alcohol use uh, in our treatment programming. I touched base just a little bit that we have opiate health home services. And again, that's a team-based approach with a nurse care manager, a peer recovery coach. We'll have a behavioral health specialist, a whole group of people kind of wrapping around that individual so that they have like one home base to go to. They can connect them with specialty care, with physical health care, with employment services, anything that they need to kind of help support them through uh, the recovery process. Some of the specialty projects that we have been able to support to address some of these issues and particularly the opiate issues, we have Project Assert, what we're very proud of in Macomb County because we were able to start this very early on, many years ago, where we take trained peer recovery coaches and they're embedded in all three of our major emergency departments in Macomb County. We have that great partnership with those hospitals and they are able to utilize the peers if somebody comes in who maybe has had an overdose or they have a substance use related issue. The peers can talk with them. They do an evidence-based practice mm -hmm. called ESPERT, uh, which is screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment kind of motivate them, I've been there, I know what it's like, I can kind of help you through. And a large majority of the people that they work with, even though that's not what they went there for, was to get substance use help, they agree to follow up with care. And so they get them connected and linked. So we see that as a very positive um, service in our community. And we gave you some of the statistics there. Another um, preventative measure that we try to help do as well is we do a lot of education on overdose of opiates and also distribute naloxone, which also is known as Narcan, which is a medication that can help reverse an opiate overdose if caught in time. And so um, we last year, our fiscal years go from October through September. So our last fiscal year, you know, you can see we almost reached 2,000 people uh, with these educational classes, distributed the kits, um, and then it's voluntary that anybody reports ever using the kit and having a save. And we were very happy that 49 people were actually took the time to tell us that this really helped and it made a difference and they were able to save a life. We think that's very impactful that the word is getting out and people are aware of that. We've also uh, newly initiated an overdose response team. So if, an, uh, if there's been an emergency call by a paramedic, you know, by an ambulance company for an overdose, they notify our contracted provider, and within a couple of days, they go out to that home and they try to do some outreach with that individual. They let them know about help, try to encourage them into services, um, and get them, you know, uh, Narcan kits if for the home, for the family, if that's needed. 
but really trying to help keep them safe and let them know somebody cares. We want to help them, you know, get through this process of, um, you know, we've just had a tragic experience by an overdose. Can't we help you and, and get you into care in case they didn't know about it? And so we've been able to successfully uh, do that as well. In our department, of course, we try and get out to things that we can. We try to spread the word, let people know that, you know, hey, we're here, there's help available, recovery is possible. Um, and so we, we kind of help host a lot of events. This year, I'm pleased to say, uh, just learned that annually there's a Celebrate Recovery event every September. It's the second Saturday of the month. And Macomb will be hosting it this year. And so we're really happy we're going to be able to use Freedom Hill for that event this year. And it's people who are in recovery, any length of time, maybe new, maybe they have 30 years of recovery. Uh, they come out and they help celebrate that event and make it a kind of public to know that, is, you know, it's not just that there's a problem with substances, but people can have healthy lives. Now I almost went there before, but the, the future plans, uh, we're doing a lot right now. Um, so we're working very closely with the, the county on expanding our crisis continuum. Um, we will be hosting um, the state of Michigan on the 27th of this month to look at some of our local facilities um, for a crisis stabilization unit. We've also been accepted as part of that pilot so I was reviewing their draft standards for that type of facility this morning. It was the, the last day to get the feedback um, to them. But um, we were added late. I think we were the, the most recent addition to that group. Um, so they will be here on the, the 27th, and we are actively working on a 24-7 facility that would be at, able to divert people from going to emergency departments or going to the jail, um, if at all possible. So it'd be a, an alternative where people could take themselves, family members could take people, friends um, or first responders <laughs> could be able to take people to be evaluated for mental health or substance <clears throat> use issues. The jail diversion expansion um, is associated with that. Um, again, we are working with the, the, the county and we did an RFP, uh, we have a, a, a vendor, a provider who was selected, um, but again, that needs a facility. Um, so we're, that's kind of the holdup on that part right now. The engagement center is on Helen's side. Again, a 24 seven facility, but it's intended to be non-clinical. Um, it's more welcoming. It's more like the uh, walking into a living room or a home. Uh, there'll be recliners. Um, it's peer run too, so it's not head up, um, headed by a, a clinician, a physician, a nurse, or anybody like that. People could go themselves, or again, first responders could take people, or people could be diverted from the crisis stabilization facility to go the go to the engagement center. They could sleep it off, get cleaned up, and then help would be available to them by the peers if they were open to that at that point in their recovery process. Um, expansion of data-driven decision-making and outcome measurements. Uh, we're making a lot of good progress in that area. Um, I mentioned our community needs assessment that was completed, so we'll be focusing our outreach efforts um, and our follow-up activities now in a much more planned fashion. We're actively looking to expand our provider network um, so we've done a number of RFPs. Um, we're working to bring new providers in. Um, we're looking, uh, I was talking to a couple of providers in other counties uh, just earlier today about coming in to provide some of the services to the very young children and their families. Increased community awareness. Um, you will be seeing us in the community more, uh, some of those pictures. We will be out and about, and we will be doing more um, marketing and publicity of our events because we need to increase awareness and decrease stigma at the, at the same time. And then increase collaborative efforts and services to meet the growing needs across the board, but especially for children. So again, we, we do work closely with the Macomb Intermediate School District, um, with uh, the county and the Andrew from the health department and uh, uh, Captain Mish from the jail and Barb Kasky, we met with all the first responders. So it was all the police departments, 
the hospital systems here um, and the ambulance companies as well, EMS. Uh, the needs in our community are great. Um, we do currently have a pilot started with St. Clair Shores Police Department where they're sending us referral information over based on the, the calls that they're getting. Um, so we're starting that and we'll, um, we have every intention of building on that as well. So lots is going, are, is going on. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or be quiet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we do have some questions. I think Mr. Uh, Commissioner Kraft. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to quickly commend Dave, Helen, and our whole CMH crew. I mean, what we do on a daily basis with the amount of staff that we have and the amount of need that's in the community is absolutely incredible. The fact that our call numbers are increasing, but our response time is going down, that was one of our main focuses when our former CEO was here. That was kind of his attack was to improve those numbers and getting us out into the community with the mobile unit and things like that have just increased you know our, our presence all over this county and I, I can't commend our team enough we we are short on staff we do need more staff as as Dave mentioned so does every other CMH across this entire state probably across this entire country and the fact that we're providing the amount of services and the quality of services that we are is commendable but Dave, I have one question for you for the boards, not for me, but for the board. Can you describe what makes Macomb CMH unique compared to the other CMHs <laughs> in the entire state? Quickly. Um, <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> there are 10 regions in the, in the state of Michigan that contract directly with the state for the Medicaid services. So we are one of 10. There are 46 CMHSPs in Michigan. That's a community mental health service program or the, the local county. Um, that's with the, the general funds and the, the public safety net services. Um, of all of those, there's three, um, Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb that are uh, standalone. So we're big enough that we are both the CMH service program and the prepaid inpatient health plan that contracts with the Medicaid services. Of those three, we are the only one that provides direct services to the extent that we do. And we are the only PIHP in the state who is also that certified community behavioral health clinic. So in the other regions, they might have one of those programs within a provider site within their region and the, they're acting as the fiduciary for those services underneath them. We are all of those things, plus an opioid health home, plus we're a My Health Link pilot area, which is people with Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so we are the only one that is all of those things. And it, uh, we create a lot of problems at the state level because they set things up for all the other regions and they don't quite fit us. Um, but we're very well positioned to take advantage of the, um, the current needs and the, the current uh, direction that the folks at the state are moving. And on that topic, I shared um, a, a summary of from the state of Michigan that addresses some of their priorities and what they're working on as well. So you can see that we're kind of in lockstep with what they're looking to do at the state <coughs> level as well. Thanks, Dave. And obviously, on top of everything that we're doing that's required to do, you've heard him say the word pilot multiple times. So not only are we doing what we're required to do, but we're taking on these other new projects that may or may not work, but we seem to be the test site for a lot of those projects. So thank you, Dave and Helen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Brown. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dave, for coming out and your team for, for putting this information together. There's so much discussion about the need for mental health services in the society today. It's just crushing. And the, the, one of the reasons that uh, the chair wanted to bring you out was to talk about capacity issues, the ability for the people, the public, to know about where to go to get services is important. They may know people that have issues, they loved ones or not. I'm encouraged by what I heard about St. Clair Shores doing the referral program. That's really important. And, and also the referrals from the schools. How many 
how many schools are you in across the county and 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 do they have a, a point of contact? Do you get referrals from them? And, and how do we integrate? Right. There, there's, there's so much need out there, and we're only one agency. And you partner with other private carriers as well to provide that continuity of care that you put out there. Um, so can you speak a little bit about the ability of the capacity issues we have to handle? We're doing many good things, but like everything else, we could probably use more in some areas. And I doubt we need less in any area because we don't have enough to just go around probably. So can you please speak to capacity issues? Yeah, that's how I spend most of my time recently. Um, so I mentioned that we're actively trying to recruit new providers into our system. Um, there's more than enough need to go around right now. In addition to that, we've been supporting our current providers. So the state implemented a provider stability program during the pandemic that gave us some uh, fiscal flexibility um, to give money out to the providers because their capacity, of course, their ability, their utilization, ability to provide services was impacted during the pandemic. Um, more recently now, um, with my board's approval, we issued capacity building grant opportunities to our system. And I was intentionally very vague I just said, if you have any ideas about how you could provide more services, provide new services, um, serve more people, put your ideas down on paper, support it with some uh, dollar, you know, some budget amounts. And what we're doing now is reviewing those internally. Um, we have about eight, eight or 12. Um, and then we're reviewing them with our finance team internally, and then we'll be taking those to the board of directors for approval as well. So we're coming at this from as many angles that I can think of, um, and I'm open to more. Um, the crisis services, um, again, are very needed because we're overutilizing the, the hospital systems right now and their emergency departments. Um, definitely hearing that from working with our county about the, the jail diversion services as well. Um, right now, the, the choices are pretty much you go to an emergency room or you go to one of the, you go through the jail process. So if we can build that up, then we'll be able to uh, keep people out of those if at all possible and direct people and expand our um, options in the community. So we're putting a lot of resources into that area right now too. With the schools, um, the schools are dealing with a lot. The schools received additional funding opportunities at the state level where they could hire staff. Um, and in other parts of the state, what, what I'm hearing is that the schools are hiring um, clinicians, clinical staff, and then they're working with kids in the school, but once that child, um, they need more services, then they're referring them back over to the local community mental health. And they're like, we're having a hard time serving those kids because the, the school hired my children's clinicians away from me to do that. Um, the good news is the Macomb Intermediate School District has told me that they're not interested in doing that. They're interested in partnering with us to meet the, the needs of those students. We do have, I've had a couple few meetings about a school health clinic which is another option for us. So we could have a clinic in the schools that could um, do some physicals, see children um, for immunizations, things like that, but also have the behavioral health component right there too. So if you go to your uh, doctor's office now for a physical, they're probably asking you a list of questions about your mood, um, and that's called the, the PHQ-9. It's a depression screening tool and it's kind of mandated now across the board on the physical health side. So a school health clinic would be a great opportunity to do things like that, where the child comes in for an immunization or for a health issue, but now we're catching their um, behavioral health issues as early as possible and um, offering that service right in that same site as well. So we're, like I said, we're, we're trying to increase people's awareness that we're here and how we can help and at the same time balancing that against our capacity <coughs> issues. And we're really um, looking at our data sources now so that we can focus those efforts and really find out where those needs are. 
the, the schools, I mean, that's, there's so many schools in our, our county. I don't know what the numbers, I don't know if there's 25, 26 school districts. Are, are they the referrals are what's your capacity ability to work to handle all of the needs of all 26 school districts i mean every the school teachers got to teach they're not they're not psychologists they're, they're, but right. they but they know what's going on with kids they see them every day they get a referral what's our capacity to handle the referrals from our school districts? it certainly can't be it, it's got to no, be, we, gotta I, be I, I couldn't open that door all the way right now no. Um, same thing with our local uh, police departments, and that's tough for me to say. Um, but because I see the the needs, you know, it's it's obvious when we look at the the national trends, the the trends here in Michigan, and then our local numbers. Um, so we're actively um, looking to grow. Uh, I mentioned last time I stood at this podium. We're, we'll, we will be bringing a, um, our phase two of our staffing proposal up through our board um, committees and then to the board of commissioners because we will be asking to add staff positions for the community mental health um, to position us better to, to meet these needs of our community um, as one thing. And then, like I said, we continue to support our current providers and look to bring new ones in and then work on these community collaboratives as well to make sure we're you know as efficient as possible in trying to meet these needs. You and I spoke before the meeting about one of the biggest challenges like our sh sheriff's department, the ability to get enough people to help do the job. Any, any employer in this country right now, everyone's got trouble getting employees to do the right job that they need. Right. And the same is true in uh, mental health, is that right? Yeah, the staff shortages are um, at critical um, crisis, you know, for us right now. Um, the ability to, to recruit and retain, uh, we were able to, in conjunction with my board and the Office of the County Executive, offer uh, recruitment, retention, and referral incentives within our provider system. Um, that was helpful. We got good feedback from, from the community and some thank yous from the specific staff that benefited from those. Um, but this is an ongoing process. I met a number of work groups at the state level on this topic and we really need to build a career path. So again, it goes back to working with the schools, working with middle school and high school students, letting them know that you can make a career in community mental health and helping people um, because right now, again, people are not as aware of that as some of the other professions um, as they go through their, their school. Um, you know, that we're here and that we have a lot to offer. Um, I tell everybody, I started as a direct care worker in a group home and I worked my way through my undergrad degree. So this has been my whole career is working in community mental health. So we just need more people to be coming in and benefiting from it as well. Thank you and your team. And you're doing revolutionary work with the jail diversion program that the administration's are running. To try. Really that's trying. going to be unique and that's going to put us, give people across the whole, all the counties great comfort to know that we're intervening with people when we obtain them right off the bat yeah. and give them the help they need rather than put them in the jail. So thank you so much. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, for bringing this in, it's an excellent presentation, and it's so timely given given what's going on in our society today. About we really have serious challenges, but nothing we can't overcome. We just have to under identify it first, and then right. divert the resources necessary to, to take care of it. So, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Wallace. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, I want to thank you, Dave, for sending someone out to my event. Uh, community mental health was at the uh, vendor fair um, and when I first presented the idea of inviting uh, the someone from mental health and someone from the health department it was a big no um, because in past experiences one people didn't show up and two it just the county name in the black community does not ring well often 
Um, so they were like, no, I don't think it's a good idea. And I was like, yeah, I think we'll just save them a table. And uh, so I'm so glad that we did because every time I looked over, there was someone at the table taking business cards. There, a lot of the kids stopped and you know took the squishy brain thing, but um, I was just really impressed with the person that you guys sent out. Um, he was very involved in the program, what was going on that day, uh, very knowledgeable of what uh, we have to offer in the mental health department, and I was just really impressed. Um, so I thank you, and uh, I had about three people come up and ask, like, who's over the mental health board now? Because, <laughs> 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 because it's different, and that's what I want people to see. Like, there, there is space for us, and there is space for us to get help that we need. It's imperative. And if you feel comfortable enough to even ask the question, then great, take this card and I'll call them and they can guide you more. And um, it was it was just really good to see. And I'm really thankful that, you know, you answered the call um, when I when I asked for that. Um, and then question uh, at the NACL conference, someone asked about a needle exchange program um, in the county. Do we have that? Because I didn't know the answer. <laughs> so we don't have that directly because our funds don't allow for that at this point in time. But there are some funds available through the state that go to safe syringe programs and <coughs> access in the, our community. Um, Arab, Arab Chaldean Council, I, I forget exactly, but in Sterling Heights, they have, uh, yeah, they have uh, that program available, and so people can do that. They can do it in person. They can. There are certain things they can do over online, and they do a lot of um, harm reduction approaches and techniques. So we partner with them on different things. Okay, that's really good to know. They did like half of their session was about that, and just what a great outcome there mm -hmm. was. And there were uh, a few people from Michigan and. Uh, just asking if we had the had a program, and unfortunately, I really didn't know the answer. I was trying to like Google it really quickly mm -hmm. and um, find it, but it's funny because they just assumed Macomb County had it. So I thought that was good that they did assume. Yeah. So we must be really great. Yeah. Um, but anyways, good job, you guys. I'm really proud to be a part of this group. Well, thank you. Part of our message is that we're here for everybody, um, so we'll be spreading that word out too. Um, and we will be doing target mar targeted marketing um, across the, the county uh, because Macomb is so big and so diverse. But thank you for this kind words. Thank you, Commissioner Wallace. Uh, Commissioner Van Sickle. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, it's always been said that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Is there any kind of test that we can administer to students at various levels in school to try to identify early on uh, issues that we can maybe counsel people back? I, I don't. I don't know how to say the right words, right. but get them back on the right track, if you will. Um, there are screening tools I mentioned, like the the PHQ nine. Um, I don't know to what extent schools are offering those types of screening services, but that's something that we could definitely partner with them on. Uh, we did, um, probably back in 20, we did kind of just a community screening fair, and we took our mobile health unit out, uh, we had clinicians, and we just talked to people in, in the community. The, the feedback was, uh, it was very well received. Uh, so we're open to doing events like that. Um, and when we do more of our planning with, with the schools, we could definitely build in that type of screening. And then you need to have the, the services behind that. So if you screen somebody and they score high, we need to make sure we're doing those types of referrals. Yeah, thank you. I think keeping people... Helping people when they only need a little help is a lot better than trying to save people when they need a lot of help. I will put a plug in. Um, one of our staff, uh, Leslie Steyer, 
did a presentation at the statewide conference on the impact of social media on children. Um, it was a packed room. People were sitting on, on the floor. Tons of really good, impactful information. So when we came back, um, the ARC Macomb is doing podcast. So we're setting her up to do a podcast on that very same topic. And then we'll be able to share that widely as well with schools, with parents. So it'll be on our website. And it's, it's really good information that parents need to be aware of that their children are being exposed to these things, They're, they are being impacted by the, their phones and the, the social media feeds. And again, it's that type of prevention and outreach and just increasing awareness. So we're, we're trying to cover as many bases. So if anybody has any ideas or suggestions, we're, we're here for that too. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Brown. Thank you. Um, you, on your assert team that you have that deals with opioids, um, you have the other work with other partners in the community, correct? And uh, one of which is FAN. And how, what's your relationship with FAN? They seem to be really coming on strong. Do, do you view them as a partner or do you view them as, a, as an adversary? So FAN is not part of our project assert team. That's care of Southeastern Michigan. Uh, they're a licensed outpatient program, and so we have certain standards for the peer services that we can purchase. And so CARE meets those criteria and provides that service for us. They also do our quick response team after an overdose as well. Uh, FAN, we do contract with them uh, in a small way. They help do our um, overdose education and naloxone distribution for us. Okay, very good. Well, as you go forward, uh, keep the board in mind so many good things you have going on and, and also lobbying efforts. I mean... The federal and state government are pretty generous with the money coming to mental health, but it's, it's other issues you may have. And, you know, call on our board to let <coughs> us know who all of us have various contacts that we might be able to assist you with. And we've got two good commissioners on your board right now that are, that are excellent with us providing this information. But, you know, and we're looking at the, that area as well. The yes. board is, we're all, we're all about it. So thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it again. Thank you, Adam Chairwoman. Thank you. thank you, Commissioner Brown. Yeah, I'd like to thank you guys, too, for coming out. I am familiar with a lot of your services, but being new to the commission, it was nice to hear everything that you guys kind of do. And even though I know that's not everything, you're just right. touch base on what you did. But, I mean, I am very familiar. CARE has been in, in my community a lot. They do a lot of events. If um, I know that they're always open to doing Narcan training in communities. If anyone's ever interested in hosting one, they do them all the time in East Point. So... Um, I think it's really beneficial um, just to even like let people know and be aware of what to look for because a lot of times people don't know. Um, so yeah, thank you again very much for coming out today. Excellent. Moving on, we're going to um, invite Ms. Jones up from Preserve Independence Counseling and Adult Daycare Center. everyone my Thank name is you. Nicole Jones and I have uh, this is Marie Kent and this is Anita Cobb they're both uh, licensed master social workers at the day program first of all I just like to really quick I mean I, I read about you guys in the I think it was the Macomb daily and um, yes. what a phenomenal job and that you guys are doing over there Thank and the, you so uh, the programs much. that you've come up with are just absolutely amazing I, I was really impressed thank, thank you, you again so for much. coming out they work so hard uh this is my staff i just want to acknowledge them they got done early and they came out um i have miss patrice she's one of our social workers as well and that back there is miranda she's one of our interns she goes to wayne state and that is miss ruth she kind of runs our whole entire show okay. <laughs> so i'm just gonna uh go over um a little bit Okay. Um, so again, my name is Nicole Jones. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am the of oh, the clicker. Yeah, you can skip. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> We're not tech savvy. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I'm sorry. I am the executive director of Preserve Independence. I am also a licensed practical nurse. We've been in business since 2018 in the city of Warren. Our mission is to provide and coordinate support services and programs that help clients stay active and healthier, both physically and mentally, to be committed to the wellness of individuals, their families, and the community through prevention, intervention, treatment, and education. 
as well as assisting individuals and their families in the enhancement of their emotional, mental, and physical well-being. We do this work because 48% of Americans suffer from moderate mental illness, 32% suffer from severe mental illness, an estimated 26%, which is about one in four adults in Macomb County, suffer from mental health disorders. Macomb County has seen an increase in the number of residents who identify mental and behavioral health as a priority topic in the community. We at Preserve are designed to provide care and companionship for adults who need assistance and supervision. Our staff consists of several licensed master social workers, direct care workers, one psychiatrist, and a nurse practitioner PCP. <clears throat> we thank you for this wonderful opportunity and we are open to any questions. Commissioner Brown. Yes, thank you. The, um, the capacity is your facility. I think you have 72 clients. 72 clients, yes, sir. Is that, is that is the maximum number? No, we can actually fit up to 100, so it just depends on a given day. Okay. Um, but we normally run between 65 and 70 a day. Uh, the director mentioned when he came in that he's looking at your facility to do a few tweaking and maybe uh, expand the capacity of, of your facility. And um, that's a good thing. Where do they come from? How do, how do people find you? How so we offer transportation. We pick up most of the clients from their residential facilities, whether it's an adult foster care home. Some of them are licensed and some of them are unlicensed homes. Um, mostly it's word of mouth and we do uh, send out information to the guardians and different things like that. But for the most part, it's just we go out in the community. What type of clients do you have there? I mean, they're, they're, all they're, mental health. Because mental health is a broad range, it's a broad spectrum of, of issues. And is there a particular cluster or is there any? I'll let Ms. Marie talk about that. Part. <laughs> um, so I think uh, a lot of our clients, um, they're adults that suffer um, from anything from depression to schizophrenia. Um, <clears throat> and so. Um, they're in the group home, so them coming to the day program, it allows them to get out of the group, get out of the group home and come to the program and interact with other people. Because these are individuals, they don't have family. Um, they don't have <clears throat> socialization. Um, so if they weren't at the day program, they're either at their group home with not so much supervision or walking the streets. <clears throat> What I like to, um, um, oh, <laughs> well, I guess I should say a little bit about myself. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> One of the things I like is, first of all, you never, as women, we never say our age. I'm 70. I worked for 50 years as a therapist in the hospitals, outpatients, and one of the things I like to look at is the fact that as we age, you never know what side you're going to be on. So when I approach our clients, I like to look at the fact, for one thing, they like to look at the fact that they see me. Because it's something about, in our age range, we go all the way up to 80. And so it's something about when they look and they see a person that's a senior, then it's not just a therapist that they're talking to. It's a person that understands what they're going through. And I'd like to believe that you never know what side of the fence you're going. It could be your mother, could be a relative, it could be you. You could be walking down the street, get hit by a car, and be on the other side. So I like to treat people like I would like to treat my family and myself and as social workers, um, we advocate. I like a team too. I like the fact that we have young social workers, we have old social workers, we have nurses, we have people who've been in mental health for years and years and years. And one of the stories that I like to tell, I ain't gonna say a name. This is a woman I treated when I was a social worker at Wyandotte Hospital years ago. And I never thought I would see her. That was 20 years ago I saw this woman. And so I like the fact that we provide a service not only for the community, but families too. 
So I'm not going to go on and on because I could go on forever. <laughs> and so, but that client is now at our program is what you were trying to say. She's still there, come there. And she goes, <laughs> Miss Bonnie. That's what they call me. Yes. She goes, Miss Bonnie, I remember you. And I remember when this woman was homeless. I remember when this woman was with a, a man that really loved her and had been with her for years and years and years. He died. And then she came back through. So you never know what's going through and sitting in front of you. And I was very grateful when you guys came out and talked about giving, you know, support that you did. So that's, I'm going to sit back on this side. Do you accept walk-ins? I, I mean, can people come walk in if they, they're just feeling depressed? And our deputies came across, it was a publicized story. It happens more often than gets attention. But the young man was out, pulled along the side of the road, was just in tears and just needed someone to talk to. He was obviously having a mental issue temporarily yes. anyway. You know, and, and the deputies helped him out and offered to support him, and he went on his way. But do you we are going to start accepting, how do we, how, uh, drop in, like drop in service. If somebody's, but social workers are so wonderful. There's days where um, individuals come in and they just need somebody to talk to, and they will stop what they're doing, <laughs> without my permission, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> they do, they will stop what they're doing, and they will start a counseling session. So yes, we do. And. Um, you get referrals. I mean, is is there what's the fee? Are there, the, how, how is how is I typically so paid for, for your services? If they're seeing a, a social worker, then it's billed through their private insurance, or sometimes we have private pay. So whether it's Medicare or Medicaid or things of that nature, when whenever they're seeing a social worker, then we build the insurance. But for an initial visit, it's around 170, 80 bucks or something like that. Because so often you know, we see and read people say, well, after the after something happens, they say, well, you know, the person was. Mentally unstable, we always do is a little, he or she was a little off or something like yes. that. But if people knew in advance where to pick up the phone and call and say, you know, refer them or give them the help, that's what, you know, that's what we're trying to do. And, and having your facility down there has, has been a big help. I mean, can you imagine if there's 70 people around the street? Yes, where we can. There's been times where we've been closed, you know, things of that nature where there was a power outage. Um, the day program is absolutely free. The only time anyone is charged anything is, is if they see a social worker where they receive uh, therapeutic services. So we have several social workers. Um, so that's the only time that they're charged. But we've had times where, you know, we had that big snowstorm, the power went out and we get in and Ms. Roof has a dozen messages from clients that have become uh, so irate because they cannot get out of the house. Uh, they feel closed in and they're having a psychotic break just from that one day. Uh, we've been asked, you know, could we open on Saturdays? We, we don't have the funding, so we can't, but we would like to offer that so that the clients aren't in the community. It's very difficult. Um, you know, like they were speaking earlier about uh, group homes and things like that. They're short staffed. It may be one individual for nine consumers. That's very difficult to take care of nine consumers with one person. So that's what our program is for, is to get those individuals out of the home during the day so that way they're not suffering that staff shortage and things like that. We come in and kind of mend that for them. How do they get to your facility? I'm we something. pick them up. We offer transportation. It's free. And so is SMART. Yes. We just passed the millage, and, and SMART has services that they are They'll pick them up and take them to locations, and they're expanding that service. I'd encourage you to give them a call. And uh, okay, yes, sir. You know, we expect them to be helping out. You know, with those type of services too. Um, and everyone's available, but you know, your group especially would probably appreciate that sometimes. Yes, so. they would definitely benefit that. All right, thank you, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Um, so I do have one quick question to. Um, well, actually, I have two questions. First sure. of all, your. Um, are you guys a nonprofit? Yes. Okay. And my second question was, um, do you guys ever like um, reach out to like the different shelters and things like that? Because I mean, I know that among like the homeless population, you know, mental illness is is, is a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, do you guys do you guys reach out to? to I've reached population? out to MCRES and have received a few referrals from them. Perfect. Okay. That's and I good. think in addition to that, we have a lot of clients that come through that come from shelters been in shelters, mm -hmm. they call them frequent flyers, they used to call them? Yes, frequent flyers. That they're coming through the mental hospitals. We got people who are coming from home. We've got, and, and, and the thing I like about it too, is that we have people 
who were teachers, who worked in the service. We've got people from all standards. All walks of life. We really do. Well, and that's what impressed me the most is like the, you said earlier, it's about giving them someplace to go during the day, to have that's that right. community. Um, because a lot of times they feel like they're alienated from yes. everyone else. That's and the key right that, there. They, yes. That's what all of them feel like. They're right. by themselves. Mm -hmm. And you can see growth. Right. Very much. You and can see people come in, they're, they're depressed, they're withdrawn. And when they be in those situations, you can actually see a lot of growth. And I think what I also like seeing is that they've built friendships coming to the program and right. um, grow on that. Um, and they look forward to coming. Um, the one, this one woman, she said that she waits by the window and waits for that bu our bus to pull up every single day. And if we don't show up because of a last minute thing, if the power is out or whatnot, um, she's very disappointed. Um, so I just like that they, um, you see the relationships that they're building with their peers, um, which is really awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you guys again. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Yes, I oh, yep. Oh, yeah. Commissioner Nard. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Commissioner Nard. <laughs> uh, Nicole's very modest. Uh, not only do she uh, take care of the people, but she also feeds them every day. They get a really good meal. Um, they also have activities and things that they do. So they, these are not people that just come to the facility and, you know, and just standing around. They have things that they do for them and with them. And I'm just very impressed. I've been there several times and the people just love her and they love the staff and her staff is awesome. They so are. I just want to just congratulate you and thank you. And I, I've been praying that everything just goes just the way that it should because this service, especially on the south end of Warren, has been here all this time. And it's just unfortunate that it was kind of overlooked, but I'm glad that I met you and uh, had a chance to see what you were doing. And, and, uh, and I know that you're just going to go up from here. I just thank you for what you're doing with this mental health thing because it's going to get, it's not going to get better. It's good. We're going to have more of this. Yeah. So, you know, I'm praying that you get more staff and uh, to handle the people that are going to come now that, that it's out there that you're there. Thank you so much. The commissioner has been a huge support. Again, she's been to the day program several times. We do provide breakfast and lunch. Um, we do uh, have an activities coordinator as well. We do exercise, uh, things of that nature. We offer uh, podiatrists. So there's several other services <laughs> that we do offer. Um, I just didn't mention them. Again, my apologies. Uh, so we just try to make it a well-rounded services. Some of our um, clients may not receive adequate meals. So we try to make sure that we're doing our part and just bridging that gap for them. And they have good meals. <laughs> <laughs> I sat down and ate with them. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Nard. Uh, Commissioner Perner. Yes, uh, I had the opportunity this week of going and touring their facility with uh, Senator McDonald, and uh, very impressed. Very impressed with the operation. And as previous commissioner just said, the opportunity of them having a meal during the day, if it's a breakfast or lunch, and it's not a cold meal, it's a hot meal. Yes, sir. And the facility was very neat, very clean, and hopefully with the community mental health, you can work with them closely, and you'll be on your way to fill that up to 100. Yes. The other question was, you mainly service, what, Warren and Centerline? So or how far of oh, the sorry. county can you accept that they're going to drive their own family members You'll accept them, right? Yes, sir. We I actually go as far as Detroit, and we go all the way out to Romeo to pick up clients. So anything within a 35-mile 35 35 mile radius. So the biggest thing you're worried about is that when you get to capacity, you're going to have to say no, right? I'm hoping I get there. <laughs> but I'm the hoping with um, community mental health, I had a very, uh, really good meeting, of course. So I'm hoping that we'll get there. Well, lots of luck to you. Yes, thank you so thank much. You. Well, thank you again for coming out. Does anyone else want to speak? Um, thank you guys again for coming out. We really do appreciate it. We appreciate everything you do for the community also. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Sir, do you need a motion to receive your file? Uh, I think we're receiving file to all three. Yes. All three. Yep. <coughs>
And now I would like to welcome Laura Rios from the Veteran Services for our 2022 fourth quarter report. Good afternoon. Did everybody get a chance to look over the fourth quarter report? So it seems like it's about six months ago, but it was only three months ago. Um, but I'm hoping you're like, well, the zip code report has been going on now for three months. Hopefully that gives you a capture of data and where we're seeing our target customers coming from. There's that one zip code in Warren that's TACOM. Nobody lives there. So I'm sure that's a typo that we had one for the fourth quarter. I'm sure that was just supposed to be 4808 or 989 or 91, and it was just a typo. But this also helps us determine if we're going to do some more marketing and campaigning, where's our target area that we need to reach. As far as our fourth quarter report, I will tell you that the increase in burial allowance that you approved earlier in the year has made it accessible and more eligible for more veterans. So we have done a few more this year than we did last year on our county burials. This year our total was 194, last year was 188, but we started halfway through the year. So we are seeing more county burials coming through there. If you notice our grant assistance, um, we have the state trust fund and we have the county relief fund. Both of them have doubled, tripled in uh, dollar amounts. So for our trust fund, which is a pot of money from Lansing that we can locally approve up to 3,500, they awarded $154,000 in assistance in 20, um, they are actually, I think, fiscal year, not calendar year, but I think I got the report for calendar year, but we gave out 154,000 of the state's money and the previous year was only 47,000. And I can tell you 100%, that's because we had more federal programs like the SARA, um, the COVID assistance relief for uh, rent. Now we have the My Half program, which helps with the folks that need help with mortgages. But a lot of those funding programs have dried up. Not My Half, but SARA has closed. And now we're seeing more assistance is needed to our veterans. So our relief fund, they used 125,000 of our millage money. In the previous year, they only used 47,000. Like with anything, we estimate what we're gonna spend. We try to forecast what we're gonna spend in our budget. And then, then there's always something that we actually spend. We try to keep an eye on it though. So we can transfer it and it's not the fourth quarter of the December. We're going, oh, we spent too much. Then the last thing I wanted just to share with you quickly, because this is real information, with my, my grant from the state, my marketing, I call it my marketing grant because I spend it all on marketing. Um, we do, even though we only have 200,000 this year versus the beautiful amount we had last year, um, we do have a very small campaign that's gonna run from May 29th through August 20th. So it's not, eight months worth. It's just a, let's hammer it out and all of the campaign is gonna run during that time frame. And we're also gonna do a Macomb Daily tabloid, like an insert. Um, it was done in Genesee County, Genesee County. It was really nicely done. Our economic development team, graphics, they're all working on putting that together for me. And we're gonna hopefully have that as an insert for one Sunday in July. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Does uh, anyone have any questions? Well, thank you again for coming out. We appreciate your time, um, as always. Oh, my budget amend my budget amendments the next. One. Oh, okay. Yep. And the next one on the docket. Well, still. <laughs> then we'll move on to um, department recommendations, a uh, budget amendment for seven neighbor veteran services. Madam Chair, we have to vote oh. on receiving and filing those. Oh yes. Sorry. You. Motion to receive and file the reports, the presentations. 
So moved. Board. We have a motion. I just we already have a motion. We have the motion. Board. 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 We're voting. <clears throat> motion passes 10 to 0. If I can get a motion for the budget amendment for veteran services. Motion to refer to full board. Support NARD. All right. So this amount I get from Community Econo well, it's Michigan Economic Impact Coalition. It's part of CEDM, which is a coalition that helps the communities. So this is my data grant for the tax program. And I have been working with them for eight years. We send them the data as far as how many returns, how many you know, people got earned income credit, how many people got child tax credit, basically data. Nobody gets names, nobody gets socials, nobody gets date of births or addresses. And for that, they, this is a pass-through grant basically from Consumers Energy to get more people to file for the homestead or the, the heat credit. And with that grant, they in turn give me 1400 14, $1, between usually 1200 to $1,500 a year. Not a huge grant. I usually dump it right into my budget because that's pretty much, I use it for paper and pens and toner for the tax program. But this year we're, we're kind of being proactive and getting it on our books. Any questions? Uh, I don't see any questions, thank you. <laughs> yes. um, we can just get a roll call please. Motion passes 10 to 0. Moving on to the next item, which is budget amendment for health, um, MDHHS comprehensive planning, um, contracting grant agreement number two for 128,000. And if I can ask Mr. Cox to come up, and if I can get a motion. So move, Wallace. Support Van Sickle. Thank you. <laughs> Coming out. Good afternoon, commissioners. Great to see you again. Like it's been a while, but it's only been a month that it is you last month, so <laughs> long time no see. Um, I've come to uh, bring to your attention, hopefully you'll approve uh, some additional funding from Michigan Department of Health and Human Services for our CPBC grant. <laughs> this is grant uh, agreement uh, number two for the year. And uh, predominantly, a lot of this money is going to our emergency preparedness program uh, in, in which there is an increase, uh, you know, roughly roughly $127,000. So a majority of, of the funding is going to that uh, project. The intent is to utilize the money uh, to uh, increase our capacity increase our capacity for mobile uh, vaccine uh, capabilities. We have, you know, and we quite frequently used our, our refrigerators, our mobile refrigerators for transportation, uh, but we lack the capacity for mobile freezers. Mm -hmm. uh, so with this, with this money, we, uh, it'll allow us to increase our capacity. You know uh, that a goal of mine is to get out into the community and it is a continual focus and priority for us with that to do mobile outreach clinics, we need the right equipment. Uh, so a predominant amount of the, the equipment dollars will be going towards that project and helping support that. The other projects that uh, we are looking at doing is, is additional um, scanners for our buildings and secure areas for emergency preparedness purposes. Um, our communication center, our public health emergency operations center that we we have, uh, as well as our our little warehouse that we we have supplies in, uh, you know, replacing a pallet stacker. Uh, this is a device. It's not a high low. Uh, you don't need a license like a high low, uh, you know, a forklift to operate that. But it's handheld. But it has hydraulics to help staff safely move pallets in that storage area. So we're looking to replace that piece of equipment this year. I'd be happy, uh, Chair, to answer any questions if there is any. Any questions? I don't see any questions. Well, so thank you very much for coming out. If we can please get a vote. Mm -hmm. 
Moving on to the next item. Motion I passes to... 10 to zero. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on, we'll go to the next item. We'll invite Mr. Cox up here for the MDHHS comprehensive plan budget. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Budget member Macomb Community, Macomb Community Action, Mr. Cook. Thank you. If I can get a motion. Support NARD. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, we have before you our first item uh, today is a decrease of $500,000 in a grant uh, that was temporarily approved the U.S. Department of uh, Labor. Um, this was a grant that was originally pursued by a former director of ours um, going back a couple of years ago, actually through the uh, office of uh, former Congressman Andy Levin. It's been that long since uh, it took to come to fruition. Uh, this was a grant after our, our former um, director left that the senior leadership felt was better suited with the uh, our partners across the hall at Verkulin Building Michigan Works. Um, this grant is uh, geared towards uh, job training and related activities. Um, we met with Michigan Works. We felt it was better suited uh, as a program for them. So we're asking our request is that you zero it out of our balance uh, of $500,000. They will come before you in a separate action and ask for an increase in $500,000 to um, continue pursuing that grant through the application process and then executing that grant. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, if we could please um, vote. All right, and moving on to the next item, we already have Mr. Cook here, which is a budget amendment from a Comb Community Action um, United Way Safety Net Program for 48000 Thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, this item before you, we're asking to move $48,000 from our operating expenses to our capital outlay. Uh, this is in order Madam to purchase. Chair, I'll make the motion to refer oh. to full board. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, this is uh, in order to buy uh, additional ramps for our ramp program. These are aluminum uh, temporary ramps that we can uh, assemble at the homes of homebound people. When they're no longer needed, we can disassemble those ramps, take them to other folks who need them. So this is uh, to buy some additional ramps and, and parts. Seeing no questions, if we can please get a vote. Motion passes 10 to 0. Moving on to our next item, which is budget amendment from a Comb Community Action, Water Assistance con um, Consolidated Appropriations Program in an amount of 154.69. If I can get a motion. So moved by NARD. Support Van Sickle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this final action we have before you is a request to decrease the amount um, for our uh, low-income home water assistance program. This is through the state's Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, the amount is for $154,069. Uh, the state typically will give um, markers throughout the uh, budget process where they tell us um, they're estimating that it costs uh, or that an allocation will be a certain amount. Um, throughout the process, we get updated amounts. The final allocation was $154,000 lower uh, than what we uh, originally had been told, so we're asking for a decrease in the budget for that amount. Thank you, and we have Commissioner Brown to ask a question. Thank you. This isn't related to uh, this money going to pay water bills. Is that what that's for? It is, Commissioner, and it's one of several programs that we have for uh, specifically for water. One of the things that's been <clears throat> Noted that the DWSD downtown has got a water fund set up to pay premiums for people that get behind under bills or having difficulty paying. And that also applies to Macomb County residents as well. Yes, sir. The Great Lakes Water Authority uh, RAP program. Uh, yeah. We administer that program for Macomb County. Okay. Most of the municipalities in the county take part in that program. So that's one of the, the many programs that we have towards water right now. There's uh, the Michigan Energy Assistance Program, this particular program, the RAP program. Uh, so there are several programs. This would be one of those. How much does DWSD pay? Do they pay the, I would always, I thought they'd have the, the largest 
thought that was like the single payer amount, but it's not. Actually, they have one of the smaller amounts that can be paid, but we are allowed to blend and combine uh, programs together in order to help people with um, arrearages, as well as through the RAP program, you can get future assistance uh, for a designated number of months. Great job, thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Seeing no other questions, if we can please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Thank you, Commissioners. Motion passes 10 to 0. And now we'll move on to public participation. If anyone at this time wishes to be heard, we will have to be given three minutes. Seeing none, we'll move on to Commissioner comments. Seeing no com comments, I guess we will. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Please call the roll. He's quick draw McGraw over there. Yeah. <laughs> Good lady. Don't leave me alone. Motion passes 10 to 0. And then I will adjourn the meeting at 421. Yeah, Sarah. Where'd he go?